So sublimation is a name for the transition between a solid and a gas. So this is a solid changing into a gas without melting. So here we have an illustration of water molecules in the solid state. They are arranged in um, an orderly fashion. These particles um, vibrate, but they're not moving relative to each other because that's what solids do. It's just the balances calibrating themselves. I know it sounds like cows. Um, Because there's the train and then there's the cow balances. Um, where was I? Okay, so in this block of ice, we have um, an average kinetic energy, which is related to the temperature. Um, and that kinetic energy is manifested as the particles vibrating, as they're wiggling in this lattice that they're stuck in. Some of them have higher kinetic energy. They're vibrating more vigorously than others. Think about a bunch of people in a boring lecture. Nobody would ever experience that. And some people are just like really antsy. They've got something they want to do. Maybe they need to use the restroom. But they're just, you know, just like having a hard time sitting still. And other people are just like chilling, like falling asleep, right? So some of these particles have higher kinetic energy, the very, very wiggly ones. Some of the particles have enough energy that they can just break loose from the solid and go directly into the gas state. That's called sublimation. Um, the opposite of sublimation, going from a gas into a solid without condensing into a liquid first, is called deposition. So if solids can sublimate, that means that solids also have vapor pressure. It's not very large but they do. Um, sublimation uh, generally occurs at a greater rate in an open container where you can't build up a vapor pressure. The particles that escape into the gas state actually escape the entire container and move away. They're not trapped again. So we observe this happening in our home freezers. Ice cubes that are left in the freezer for a long period of time slowly shrink. You may have noticed this, you see some ice cubes trapped in the back of the ice cube, um, the ice maker, or if you use the old-fashioned trays, um, that, that tray way on the bottom that never gets used, you look at it and it's like, why are these ice cubes so small? Who, who didn't fill it up, right? Well, they probably were full size to start with, but they have sublimated. In the freezer, you have solid ice, but some of those water molecules have enough energy to escape and they will go into the gas state and bounce around inside your freezer and deposit somewhere. Um, we observe that ice crystals grow inside airtight bags of frozen foods. Tater tots come to mind. You open a bag of tater tots, especially if you bought it, you know, a while ago and you forgot about them. You dump it out in the pan and there's all the tater tots and then there's a whole bunch of ice crystals. Why would they package ice crystals with the tater tots? Don't they know that that melts and it gets the tater tots all soggy even before you bake them, right? Well, they didn't do that. That water was in the tater tots to start with. And what happened is that it sublimated while it was in the freezer and instead of those water molecules in the gas state going back into the tater tot, they deposited somewhere else randomly, and crystals have grown outside the tater tots. So this causes dehydration of food in the freezer. It's known as freezer burn. The water that was in the food is moving to a different part of the container. Um, couple of ways you can get around this. You can use a deep freeze. The colder the temperature in the freezer, the less sublimation will occur. Or you can seal the food um, without any air space. So that's why when you're like freezing a steak, you want to wrap it very tightly, perhaps in foil, before you wrap it in plastic to reduce any air space. Or you can use one of those cool um, vacuum sealers to pull the air out. If there's no air space 
when a molecule of water tries to sublimate, it can't really go anywhere and it has to just kind of come back to the food that it came out of. Any questions about stuff happening in the freezer? Yeah. So, like, you're talking about sublimation, that's completely skipping a step? Exactly. It's completely skipping the liquid. Okay, so it is gradual, even though it's skipping that liquid state? Yeah, so sublimation will happen um, at different rates depending on the circumstances. But yes, any solid, you can have sublimation, you can have particles escaping, and they're going directly into the gas state instead of the whole thing melting first and then evaporating or boiling. It's not something that's obvious, but it does happen. Any other questions? I remember wondering as a kid why ice, cu ice cubes could shrink in the freezer, right? What's up with that? Well, and why does frost build up all over your freezer? It's not just from opening the door. You open the door and some moist air from the room comes in. You close the door, the air cools down. Any moisture that was in the air freezes and becomes you know, frost inside your freezer. But even if you never open your freezer door, you'll still get frost buildup because of sublimation. Um, dry ice is solid carbon dioxide. Uh, solid carbon dioxide doesn't melt at any temperature, at normal atmospheric pressure. You can't have liquid CO2 at atmospheric pressure. So it sublimes, it doesn't melt. And that's why it's called dry ice. It's ice that doesn't get wet, right? So that's really useful when you want to keep something cold, but you don't want it to get all soggy or make a mess. And so like you're shipping a medicine that needs to be kept cold, you can put dry ice in there. Um, you have to allow the CO2 to vent. Uh, you don't want to let carbon dioxide sublime in a closed container because pressure can build up. But as long as it can escape into the atmosphere, there is CO2 in the atmosphere anyway, so it's not like we're adding pollution or anything. Um, the CO2 will slowly sublime and go away without making a mess. There's no liquid that happens. So here's a picture of some dry ice. And we see these like this cloud around it and these little lines here. What we're seeing there is not the CO2 that's subliming off of that chunk. What we're seeing is the effect of the cold moving away from the, the dry ice. And it's this white stuff here is actually the moisture in the air condensing. So essentially, it's making a little cloud of water. Okay, so that was the gas-solid transition. If we look at uh, the solid-liquid transition, when something melts, it's called melting <laughs> or fusion. So fusion is another word for melting. The opposite of melting is freezing. So this is, these are transitions between states, solid to liquid, liquid to solid. Um, I've asked questions on exams before. I've asked what's the opposite um, of melting, and people will say boiling. Well, I, I can kind of see your reasoning there, but it, that's not. Um, melting and freezing are opposites. Boiling and condensing are opposites. Sublimation and um, deposition are opposites, okay? Because that could come up on an exam. So as we increase the temperature of a solid, say a block of ice, the molecules are going to vibrate faster. They're gaining thermal energy, which is a form of kinetic energy. They're getting more antsy in their seats. Right? At the melting point, the molecules have enough thermal energy to overcome intermolecular forces and slide around. Okay? And so the solid becomes a liquid. So what we observe with a heating curve 
for a solid is similar to what we saw with a liquid. As you heat the solid, the temperature goes up until you get to the melting point. So for ice, this is at zero degrees Celsius. Once you get to the melting point, any additional heat that is put in goes into um, breaking those intermolecular forces and causing more melting. The temperature will not go up until all of the ice has melted. And at that point, the temperature will go up again. This is an extremely useful phenomenon because if we want to perform an experiment at zero degrees Celsius, we don't need fancy equipment. You don't even need a thermometer. All you need is a big bath of ice water. If you have ice and water together, the temperature of that will be zero degrees Celsius. So very, very convenient. So melting is an endothermic process. To melt ice, you put energy into it, right? We've talked about the transition between liquid and gas vaporization. We talked about the heat of vaporization. Here we're talking about the heat of fusion. So remember that fusion is melting. Um, that is not necessarily uh, an everyday use of the word fusion, although like if you talk about fusion in terms of different sorts of um, cooking styles, you know, it, it's blending or mixing different ways of cooking. I think of melting chocolate chips. So you heat chocolate chips up and as they, they begin to melt, they get soft and they fuse together into one big mass, if that helps you remember. Fusion is melting. So heat of fusion is the heat required to melt one mole of a solid. So we can represent that as a chemical equation here. One mole of water in the solid state going to one mole of water in the liquid state. And the heat of fusion here is 6.02 kilojoules per mole. It's always a positive number. So melting is endothermic. That means that freezing is exothermic. If you freeze a mole of water, you have to remove 6.02 kilojoules of energy per mole. So freezing being exothermic is not an immediately obvious thing. So you think about freezing a liquid, freezing water into ice, you don't think about that giving off energy. But how do you make it colder to freeze it? you have to suck energy out of it. That's what the condenser and compressor in your, um, in your refrigerator, your freezer is doing, is it's pumping energy, heat energy out of the inside. So freezing is exothermic. I live in Reedley, um, where we, we call ourselves the fruit basket of the world. Um, there's an awful lot of fruit grown around Reedley, and there's a lot of citrus trees. Um, so citrus trees have fruit in the winter, and when the temperature drops below about 26 degrees Celsius, I mean Fahrenheit, when it drops below 26 Fahrenheit, then the, the oranges are in danger of freezing. So that, of course, is not a good, good situation. So how do you keep oranges on the tree warm? You can do that by watering the fields. So when a freeze is expected, they'll irrigate the fields, sometimes even flood them so that there's water standing around. So as the temperature drops, temperature drops down to zero degrees Celsius, 32 degrees Fahrenheit, the water begins to freeze. If we look at this heating curve, it works the same forwards or backwards. As, as the temperature drops, we get down to zero degrees Celsius, 32 Fahrenheit, the water begins to freeze. The temperature will not go below until all the water has frozen. So you can't keep the fields warm, but you have this layer that you can keep at 32 degrees Fahrenheit, which is above the freezing point of the oranges themselves. And then if you throw in some wind machines, to blow that slightly warmer air around, you can stave off freezing at least for a little while. And that's usually long enough to protect the oranges. Any questions?
I think that's a really, really cool application of chemistry to save the orange crop. Uh, heats of fusion are generally smaller than heats of vaporization because to melt the ice, you only have to partially overcome the intermolecular forces. Whereas to boil it or to vaporize it, you have to completely break, break loose. And so we see that heats of vaporization are larger. Here's a graph showing that. So vaporization in the pink and fusion in the blue. And we see that the uh, energy needed to vaporize is much, much higher than what's needed to um, melt. Uh, here's a table from your textbook showing several uh, liquids of possible interest, their melting points, and the heat of fusion. So those are not things you memorize, you just look them up when you need them. So here's a, an illustration in the next section. So I'm going to stop this. <laughs>